Okay, friends, I am thrilled to be joined with none other than Dan Murphy of Sportsnet, someone who I've been watching, admiring. We're almost the same age, so that tells you how old both of us are. So, Dan, thank you for joining me today on the Zoom chat series. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Clay? Things are good. Things are good. Uh, back at work, I'm actually, because of our recording time, I'm still in my work office, but uh, good connection, good setup. And uh, off day for you, or just because the Canucks weren't playing doesn't mean you were off today? Uh, I went to just uh, into the office today because they're, um, they decided to cancel practice, but just kind of uh, looking towards, you know, uh, this week and then what might happen in the play-in series. So just trying to figure out logistically what exactly is going to be happening with uh, myself and the rest of the Sportsnet reporters. Yeah, a great segue. Uh, it's almost like you saw these questions or something. Do you know what your responsibilities are going to be for the postseason? Do you have a sense at least? Well, uh, for the longest time, I thought there was no chance we were going anywhere near the hub city because um, if you can't have access to the players and you can't go to practice, then uh, you can watch the games from home and record your stuff from home um, and follow your stories with the Zoom interviews. But as it stands now, it looks like I will be going to uh, Edmonton. Oh. Um, I believe that even though, uh, so myself, uh, Gene Principe, Ryan Wesley, even though we're not in the bubble, one of us can go into the rink at a time, sort of watch the game. And I think we'll be part of the world feed doing some interviews, not in the same room, uh, separate rooms, but uh, walk-offs and probably pre-game stuff. So uh, in some capacity, uh, I'll be working perhaps the world feed and then, of course, reporting and doing some chats with uh, Ian McIntyre or uh, Eric Francis or Mark Spector. So uh, I will be heading to Edmonton for at least a play-in round. Well, and your family cool with it? I guess. They yeah. I mean, we've spent the last four months, you know, staring at each other and uh, <laughs> homeschooling and, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough time to go away in the middle of the summer, but yeah. um, it's been so, uh, you know, it's kind of weird not working and it's nice to have something to look forward to and have a routine. So, um, you know, in an ideal world, it wouldn't be this way, but uh, yeah. I'm not going to turn down the work at this point. Of course, Dan. And I find that fascinating, actually, because as, as you know, sports had announced their their lineups, their broadcasting lineups. And I, I am aware that it is the returning Chris Cuthbert and Louis DeBrusque in Edmonton, right? And yep. and Houston and Simpson are in Toronto. But it's kind of fascinating. So it sounds like you might be called in to do some stuff for the that broadcast or the world feed that we've talked about. Like, I guess it's going to change every day. We, uh, you just got to stay on top of things, I presume, and be be flexible. Yeah, I think it'll be a rotation. So maybe if Gene does one day, then maybe I'll do the next day and Ryan will do the next day. So you're not having continuous 14-hour days at the rink because it's three games, right? Yeah. Who, who knows about overtimes? Uh, if one goes multiple overtimes. So it could be a little challenging uh, that way. So, yeah, totally flexible. Uh, some days in the rink and probably some days outside the rink and hopefully a couple of days off as well. Uh, but, you know, I'm probably not going to venture too far from the hotel and be wearing my mask. <laughs> yeah. Um, Still trying to stay as safe as possible uh, because yeah. I, I really, I really want this thing to get to, to the finish line. That's for, for sure. sure. No, I think we all do. Do you have like a cool mask or is it one of the more you know standard surgical ones? Yeah, I've got just the standard. I've got like a black one and a white one, and just I okay. wash them continuously. And I have a whole bunch of uh, you know ones that are just a one-time wear in my car. So if you go in the grocery store and stuff, so. I don't yeah. have anything cool. Maybe I should try to find a cool one before I go. Yeah, well, anyone watching this uh, on, on my YouTube channel, send Dan Murphy a, a cool mask before he goes. And yeah, I was at Ikea with the family yesterday and wearing the mask. And I, I just did one, I jogged up one flight of stairs and I just realized it's just completely different feeling. Like, a, or maybe I'm just yeah. in really bad shape, one of the two things. Yeah. <laughs> it is a little different, but I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it's a pretty easy thing to do to try to keep everybody safe. No, I totally agree. So, uh, Dan, from what you anticipate and what you've heard to be true, what's going to be the most intriguing thing about broadcasting these uh, these postseason games for you? Well, I, I'm interested to see what different camera angles they'll be able to get. I mean, obviously, uh, with no fans in the stands, you can utilize different parts of the building that you normally wouldn't get. Um, I don't know if anything's been agreed upon with uh, the referee helmet cam again. Like, I love that <laughs> on some Saturday nights. Uh, sometime you have the robo cam too along the wire. So uh, they've kept it pretty close to the vest, the NHL yeah. and, and NBC and Sportsnet. But I would assume we're going to get some different looks. I know people were upset with the announcement that perhaps there's going to be a six-second delay. Uh, I'm sure that's something the players wanted because yeah. protect themselves if they slip with something that shouldn't be said. Yeah. Um, that's off color or something or, or, or even worse, right? That, uh, that they still could get suspended for or fined for that if it even happens now. So um, we'll see if that in fact goes through. But I think even with that, we're going to get to hear a lot more than we ever have. Yeah. And uh, the mics are so hot. 
Uh, we're going to hear some good chirping. So I think audio wise, while it's going to be different and it's going to be weird not to have giant cheers and moans for goals and hits. Yeah. Um, I, I hope that there are enough innovative ways where you can keep this captive audience uh, entertained with, with, with not just the hockey, but some other cool things. Yeah. You make such a good point though, about that, uh, the six second delay, because we saw how that simple Horvat yelling across the ice at Britannia and took off yeah. in this market. Just imagine it's going to be way worse than that. And, you know, imagine what the kind of the hoopla that would get. No, that's a really, really good point. Wow. Yeah, um, so yeah, cause, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, and even, I mean, in, in playoffs in the past, I mean, uh, Burroughs and Kessler with, uh, <laughs> Uh, who was a David Backus, right? I mean, that kind of stuff. I mean, it gets picked up and people, yeah. people with the, this day and age in social media, people are going to figure out exactly what was said and who said it. Yeah. The famous tell Kelly, I said, hi, isn't that it? it that's the one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. I well, I haven't said that in about 15 years. Uh, you've been at training camp, the scrimmages this week. Yeah. What has stood out to you or more importantly, who has stood out to you? I think I'm like most people, um, you know, I don't like to make blanket statements after two scrimmages, but we only have, so much to base our opinions on. I yeah. think that uh, the skates have been hard, especially the first couple of days. Uh, that's signature Travis Green. Um, I think that that, uh, especially in the second scrimmage, the, the Roussel, Gaudet, and McEwen line looked excellent. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think Besser has looked like he's had a step back. I, I would say that for Roussel as well. I, I hope that that extra time off uh, helped his knee considerably because going into the break, it looked like he was lagging a bit uh, so those would be my, you know, main takeaways. I mean, I, I can't tell how sharp they are. You can't tell, um, much, uh, other stuff when we watch. So I would say overall, it's been a pretty good camp so far, this team. That's awesome. Yeah. It sounds like, and what I've seen, it's, uh, pace is being good. Guys have shown up ready to go and they're committed. Um, a lot of talk obviously in this market about Jake Vertanen and about Zach McEwen possibly yep. supplanting him on that third line. And from all, everything we've heard, it sounds like McEwen fit right in last night. Well, and I, I should go back and look because I, I think I'm remembering correctly, but I, I believe the final game before the break, I think it was Roussel, Gaudet, and McEwen on the third line. I think that, Rutana was on the fourth line. That is correct, yes. So uh, is he supplanting him or is he just taking back his spot that was his? <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, if it's got chemistry, I think uh, McEwen and, and or Furland are kind of guys that you're going to want at this time of year if Furland's able to play. Uh, I think that Minnesota's got a big physical lineup. They're going to play that meat and potatoes game. And I think you do need a couple of players that can counteract that. Uh, that's not to say that Jake is not going to be in the lineup. Who knows about Brandon Sutter? If Sutter's healthy, he's playing, I believe. They need him for his penalty killing. I agree. Uh, if, he's, if he's not, then it's kind of Jake or Louie. And I guess it depends on the matchup for Travis. Because, again, you have to look at penalty killing that Louie brings. And uh, Jake doesn't. And you have, to, you have to factor that into these decisions. Yeah. Um, now, if you want a little more offense, I think we know Jake. He's got the speed, north-south. He's got a great shot. And if Travis trusts him on that fourth line, shelters him a bit, then, hey, I'd like to see Jake in there too. But, um, you know, for the first time in a while, we don't have to roll our eyes when, when Travis says, I've got some legitimate decisions to make in the bottom six because he really does, especially if Furland is healthy to play. Well, that's a great point, Dan, because if it is a third line of Gaudet between Roussel and McEwen, and then you know that Mott and Beagle are going to play. But that, yeah, that's only three. That's Roussel, Mott, and Beagle. You need a fourth penalty killer. And that's, I agree with you. That's where Sutter, and then if he's not there, Erickson would maybe have the leg up on, on Furland and Vertanen because of that very role. Uh, is it oversimplistic to say this is going to be this the Canucks forwards and the Canucks goaltending against the Minnesota Wild defense? Like, is there anything else that stands out to you um, about the series that you're really intrigued about? Um, well, I, I think... Uh... I think you can look at Minnesota's forwards versus Vancouver's defense too, because I think yeah. it's been documented. Uh, uh, I don't know if it was Corey Schneider uh, said that they dump and chase more than any team in the league. Mm. So that is going to put an onus on Vancouver's defense to get the puck uh, quickly and transition it quickly as not to get trapped. So I think that's a big storyline as well. I think that um, when you haven't played in a long time, perhaps a, a layoff is going to hurt the skilled team a little bit more because you don't have that time to really get up running gunning. So that might be an edge in Minnesota's favor uh, that they're just going to play that physical game. And I think we're really going to have to see how Vancouver can make their way through the neutral zone to gain the zone of Minnesota because they are one of the stingiest teams in the league that way. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really interested to see how uh, Erickson Eck, who has taken a tough time in Minnesota, right, because they didn't take Brock Besser. Uh, they ended up taking him. Uh, but I think he could be a pivotal player in this series too. He's big. He's physical. Apparently he's a big pest. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's the guy that's going to be tasked with checking Elias Pettersson. So, 
I think there's going to be a lot of fun storylines in this one too, with Fiala versus Vancouver's top pairing. Yes. Uh, so I, I think there's going to be, it, it's a shame it's only five games, but it doesn't, it doesn't take more than one game for some of these storylines to really uh, take hold. No, absolutely. All, all things that we're going to, uh, keep an eye on it. It's kind of cool. I mean, uh, my viewers here, they know that August 2nd, their first game, Vancouver, Minnesota. It's also my son, Sean's 19th birthday. So we're hopefully having a very good celebration <laughs> on that day, but but we shall see. Um, another question about, um, you know, about the Vancouver Canucks itself. Let's look past this series. And we know that there's five UFAs. We know that there's five RFAs. We know that there's only 60 million in cap space. Believe it or not, they're in a better spot than Tampa, but that's, that's another, um, you know, another story. Is, um, would you agree that the priorities from what you've heard and who you talked to in order on the UFA side are Markstrom to Foley Tanev, or is that not necessarily the case? Well, I think that might be what they're looking at, but you know, I don't know if you read between the lines. I don't know if Vancouver is Toffoli's number one destination at this point. I don't know yeah. if he's got eyes back in LA. I think his wife was working for the Dodgers. Mm. So there are, there are uh, connections there. So maybe he'll be listening to offers there too, but if he likes it, they go on a run. Uh, Markstrom, I think, definitely is the number one at this point. That's the guy you have to lock up. I, not Nothing against Demko, but yep. I think you still want to clear that up. Um, you know, Tanov might be a tough one to get done. Um, if if they do indeed uh, somehow get to Foley and Markstrom, then Tan Tanov might be a guy that uh, there may not be a spot for. Um, right. Unless, of course, we always know the statue rumors that that's the guy that's going to be cut loose, but uh, he's a little more cost-controlled. Um, so, uh, and then Vertanen is going to be due for a raise as well. Uh, yeah. so I, you know, I, I would say Markstrom for sure one, and you might get lucky if Toffoli has eyes somewhere else, then you might not have to worry that much about that, even though I think he's been in the 10 games you're seeing a tremendous fit so far. Absolutely. And I, I guess as I think about this for Toffoli and Vertanen, you know, they can obviously drive up their value with a really good postseason, making it even harder on the Toffoli side. But on the RFA side, yeah, it's kind of fascinating. I've always said that I would, not just because I'm from Richmond, but I would prefer Stetcher over Tanev. Yeah, you're right, younger, cheaper, and he can still be a solid uh, top four. But this whole Jake Vertanen thing is kind of fascinating because if he loses out on his chance for playing time, he gets you know, booted out by a guy like McEwen, then that's not going to help his chances when it comes to negotiation. So it's, uh, that part's really fascinating to me. And I, I don't know, you know, I don't want to, not that you'll get in trouble. You, you're very good at what you do, but... Um, do you know if the Canucks management at all are taking pause given how Vertanen's always in the news every few months, or is that kind of overblown in this market? Well, I mean, it's always going to be a big hot topic. I mean, he's from here. He was a high draft pick. Um, you know, some of the players taken after him. I think a lot of people want him to succeed, right? Um, yeah. Kind of like lovable Jake, but there's been more than one occasion. I mean, look back, the Justin Bieber one was posted <laughs> at whatever, five in the morning and you know, driving with his equipment on in Kelowna and then, so, I mean, sometimes Jake can't get out of his way, and I'm, I'm sure that management and coaching staff talked to him about that, but I, I do think he probably has matured quite a bit. He's still such a young guy, um, and he's definitely matured on the ice. I mean, he was going to have 20 goals this season, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's an, a, a fine season uh, for Jake. So, I, I mean, guys can continue to learn, and I think guys continue to mature, and he's made some mistakes along the way. And, and, and not that it, like, he was there, he did nothing wrong. It mm -hmm. was more the optics, right? Everybody's yes. trying to stay safe and, 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 and keep healthy and keep your teammates healthy. And, and just the fact that he was out, even if he was social distancing, even if it was a was group of six, um, it's just more the optics of it at that time. And I kind of feel bad for him about that, but sometimes Jake should try to get out of his own way, I think. Yeah. No, well said. And one more on ice question, then I, I want to ask you a couple questions about broadcasting. Um, let's presume, let's go with Clay's, my theory of that we keep Stetcher over Tanev. And then next year, you're on the blue line, you're looking at a, a top four of Hughes and uh, Edler on the left, and then let's say Myers and, and Stetcher on the right. Now you got to fill out this bottom pairing. Uh, Fandenberg's probably gone as UFA. Ben has one more year, play both sides. Are we confident enough where two of our bottom, you know, our bottom pairing is going to come from the four guys of Ben, Rafferty, Yolevi, and Rathbone? Is that good enough for next year? Well, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, I, obviously Ben can play, um, you know, as, as a, a five, six, uh, yeah. I think, I don't know. I'm not as in tune as a lot of these, uh, the draft guys, uh, you know, about Rathbone and uh, how much he's developed. I can only read what you read and most people yeah. read. And it seems like he's got from what people say, a chance to crack the lineup. Rafferty had an excellent uh, rookie season, in the American hockey league. He's a, but he's a smaller puck moving guy as well. So, um, but sometimes when you're in these flat cap situations, it's not perfect for any team. 
Yeah. And you need to find ways to fill out the bottom of your roster with guys on entry level contracts. So they may have no choice but to plug those guys in, in those spots. Great point. And we've, Obviously, we enjoying the luxury of having Pedersen and Hughes on the last year now, but we've had two yeah. years of them on, on cheap. That's a really good, and that way we can afford to pay some other guys who we will not name. Okay, a couple of broadcasting questions for you because, um, you know, I, I get a lot of positive feedback. I'm not gunning for anyone's job. I think I'm too old, maybe don't have the right look for TV, but I am fascinated by what you guys do, and I appreciate what you guys do, and I see you around the arena up on, and the perch there. So a couple of things. Um, what's the favorite, your favorite part of your job overall? I know it's kind of a general easy question, but yeah. what's your favorite part of your job? Well, I'm, I'm going to say the favorite part of my job is working with John and John. There's no wow. question about that. It's been a long time uh, partnership. Um, I've said this on many podcasts or uh, Instagram lives or Zoom calls that I've, ne I've seen John Garrett in a bad mood once in my entire life. That speaks volumes, volumes about the man. I've known John Shorthouse and worked with him since 95. Wow. Uh, we get along great. And, uh, and Greg Shannon, our producer as well. I yeah. put him in there. So it's, it's the people I work with first off, because you spend, I spend as much time with those guys as I do with my own family. No joke. <laughs> I'm on the road, I'm on the road 120 days a year. Yeah. So that would be the first thing. And the second thing is just, it's just the unpredictability of sport. I may be doing the same thing every day, but that thing changes every day, right? Yeah. In terms of the content, uh, the storylines, the games, the excitement. So I, I think just the unpredictability of sport. Um, and also, I mean, it's uh, the, the passion of this Canucks fan base. Like, uh, you know, people always say like, do you get tired of people asking about the Canucks at the gym? I'm like, no, because people care. <laughs> and you'd rather be working, uh, covering a team where people care than where they don't. So I would say off the top of my head, those would be the things. Oh, I love it. And yeah, I, I love what you said there, Dan. Also, when people talk to me about bandwagon fans, I love bandwagon fans because that's how you sure. grow, grow the fan base. If you don't have those guys, when we go with it, there's, yeah, you need people to replace us or at least, um, no, add to us. That's awesome. Who are your favorite players to interview, just either past or present? Well, I mean, uh, people know the relationship I have with Kevin Bieksa. Yeah. Uh, so, but if I'm going to go back and like start at the beginning, uh, Jason Struggle was excellent. And we hear oh. him now as a broad broadcaster. He was just an always a fun interview. Uh, Shane O'Brien was always a riot yeah. uh, to interview. Uh, Kevin Bieksa, of course, and his yeah. hijinks. Um, <laughs> I'd say on this, on this current team, I think Troy Stetcher gives the most thoughtful interviews. Mm -hmm. um, I think so if you're if something happens and you need an opinion that has a little meat behind it I'll often go to to Troy uh, if you're looking for an opinion to stir things up with something happened on the ice you go to Antoine Roussel <laughs> um, so I mean that that would kind of be through the progression but there's been many over the years I mean Nolan Baumgartner as a player was a real fun interview yeah uh, there's you know there's guys in in, in different markets who like to have fun too this and that when he was playing was always fun you know you could get a rile out of him so there's been player uh, Chris Pronger. Yeah. Never easy, but he will you know, he'll give you the good stuff. So I would say those are guys off the top of my head too. Oh, fascinating. Is there anyone that uh, you just didn't have a really good experience with and maybe even multiple ex bad experiences with? Well, I wouldn't say uh, bad experiences, but yeah. there's some more awkward ones, you know, where the language barrier hurts. I mean, uh, Alex Edler and I, we basically have an understanding that I'll only ask for him like once a, once a month. And I say, then you have to at least give me more than three word answers if I ask for you because it can get a little awkward. And Michael Samuelson was another guy who stepped <laughs> all over each other's interviews. So, but they were always kind of fun. I mean, um, yeah. but I, I'm trying to think if I've had any bad experiences where guys were unhappy with questions. Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't think so. I mean, I found baseball when you cover that difficult because there's no set time to interview these guys for the uh -huh. camera. So a lot of times you got blown off and that sport was tough. Right. I mean, ba basketball, I did the Grizzlies before yeah. the Canucks. I was just going to say and, that. You did a bit of Grizzlies, yes. And that was a riot because these guys, you do the interview, they'd be lying on the ground with a towel on their head uh, on the court, like with Charles Sprewell. Like, so, okay, can we talk to you? Yeah, go ahead. And it doesn't get up. So you got to kneel down, you put the microphone down in front of the space, and you get your interview. So uh, those could have been, those were a lot of fun. Some of those uh, weird ones, Alan Iverson was <laughs> like that as well. I remember Reggie Miller being prickly. We were there with Barry McDonald, and he, didn't want to talk because it, it oh. didn't say ES, ESPN on the mic lag, but, um, yeah. but yeah. yeah. Interesting. Well, I might, I might try it. That's a good look. I might put a towel over my head and maybe some of my viewers might appreciate that. That's, that's a good look. Uh, what's your favorite broadcasting or interview memory, Dan? Um, well, see, I've, I've never got to host a, a Canucks playoff game, right? Uh, the last mm -hmm. time in the playoffs, Rogers had the rights, but I believe Scott Oak did it. And I went and did Tampa versus Detroit. Ah. Uh, so in terms of playoffs, so I did Vegas in their first year. I did the first two rounds. So I did them versus LA and then them versus San Jose. 
wow. that was an absolute blast to be in that rink. It was so loud. The energy was so great outside. Yeah. That would definitely be one. Um, also, I, I did on-course commentary for the Canadian Open for a number of years. So I was in uh, Toronto, Glen Abbey, when Tiger won at 2000. Yes. Uh, so I was on the grounds there for that. Now, I wasn't with his group. Peter Oosterhuis was. But mm -hmm. I was behind the green uh, for, for that shot. I'd say that was another good one. Um, you know, just th th those in terms of live broadcasts. Yeah. I'd say those are good. The Sedin retirement, uh, Sedin last home game was a yeah. lot of fun to be a part of. Uh, Absolutely. That'll, that'll always be a highlight uh, as well to be uh, to be on the ice and interview at the end of that and just see the ovation and the players. So yeah, yeah. Fans screaming one more year and these guys are saying, yeah. no, we're going to pass it on to Bo and those guys. And Brock, yeah, yeah. no, you did a great yeah. job. Actually, I had a question about that. Um, usually I'm watching Sportsnet and it's 701 or 702. And you'll be basically one of the first guys they throw to you down on the glass, right? It's before the players have come out. So all the, you know, pregame video. Is it hard to hear yourself or are you, are you okay? Cause you're, you're all wired up and stuff. Cause that's what seemed crazy. And I think of Vegas, that place is nuts. I've been to one game yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it could be like, uh, so you wear the, the, wear the earphones uh, yeah. and, and they're pretty good noise canceling. But if it's so loud, you just have to trust because you don't want it. Cause, cause you're, it's picking up your, the mics are so good. They pick up your voice. And if you start yelling, it's going to be so distorted, even though you're like, well, nobody can hear me because I can't hear myself. So you have to be careful with that. But yeah, I mean, all the time, I remember I used to do uh, the open right in front of the, uh, the, the, the box by the players' benches. And Bertuzzi was right in front of me, like sitting right there and the cameras there. And he would be yelling at me, but I couldn't hear what he was saying. But I could see him yelling at me, probably swearing at me, but I couldn't hear him. I only knew he was trying to distract me. I love it. I love it. And now uh, being a 25 year veteran, basically, right? A broadcasting now, is that correct? Yeah. Probably, More or less? Yeah. 20, yeah. Yeah, I start, yeah. I started on the air in 99, but I, I worked right. at sports page for four years prior to that as a, started right. as a, a social, uh, production assistant and I moved up to a producer and a writer. Okay. So what would a, what would a now, you know, I won't give your age, but close to my age, Dan Murphy, 50. tell. I turned okay. 50. I turned 50. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you're yeah. pretty, I, I interviewed my cousin, Dusty, who's a, you know, goaltending coach. Yeah. And I would say that you and him are two of the coolest looking, like youngest looking 50 year olds I know, but uh, <laughs> take that as a comment. What would a uh, 50 year old Dan Murphy tell a 29 year old Dan Murphy starting off 21 years ago? Um, you know, give him some good advice. Probably um, when you get in the business, don't be afraid to be a little more aggressive to pursue sources and contacts. When you first get in the business, you tend to be a little more reserved. You, 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 you know, you kind of like, I, I remember having to cover the board of governors meeting in, in <laughs> Palm Springs in 99. So I get down there and I see Tony Gallagher, Bob McKenzie, Al Strack, and like all these guys. And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm going to get scooped so badly down here of stuff that's happening. And I, and Bob McKenzie said something to the fact like, don't worry, these gyms don't want to talk to us either. So, um, but I, I'd say, yeah, like, you're never too young to make contacts. You're never too young to build trust. Um, so I would say just starting out, uh, I could have done a better job at that uh, instead of waiting a little bit longer until you know, you know, you're, you've been around longer than seen you. So I think that's one thing I would say to myself. Oh, that's great advice. Uh, no, for any aspiring uh, broadcasters out there, that's awesome. Okay, let's end off last uh, three or four minutes really quickly. It's uh, six questions called the six pack. You can answer them as broadly or as uh, quickly as you want to, okay? Three okay, connects, yep. three connects away, three non. First one, are you an extrovert or an introvert? I'm an introvert. Really? Yep. Totally. Yep. I, uh, people always find that hard to believe because of what I do, but yeah. they say you talk to sometimes in the playoffs, a million people. I'm like, no, I'm talking to one camera. Yeah. I'm not talking to a million people. So it's not like public speaking. So, but <laughs> uh, definitely, I, I think maybe when I was younger, I was more of an extrovert, but I definitely, as I got older, a little bit more of an introvert. Cool. And by the way, speaking of the camera, I know I've tweeted this to you and you responded. You are the best I've seen at acknowledging the person you're speaking to and the camera and the, and you, it's tricky, right? Cause you can't just stare at the camera because then it didn't look like you're paying attention, but you can't just stare at the person because then you're not engaging yeah, you, with the you, audience. So that's probably, it's a three um, yeah, they always say it's, a, it's a three, it's a three way conversation between yeah. the person you're talking to or four way and the camera. Cause you always yeah. have to at least let the viewers know you're still, you're For still sure. there. My favorite is the person you're interviewing when they look at the same time. So you guys are kind of doing this together. I, I really like that notion. I think that's really cool. Uh, number two, uh, use whatever definition of the word important as you want. Who's more important to the Canucks future? Ellie's Patterson or Quinn Hughes? Quinn Hughes, defenseman. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think Patterson has a chance to be 
perhaps the best player the Canucks have ever had. And that's saying a lot. I mean, anyway, yeah. guys going to the Hall of Fame coming up here pretty quick and two of my yeah. favorites of all time. Yeah. But, I mean, there's a chance. I mean, his numbers are kind of equal to Burray's right now. So if he has more of a long, uh, longevity with his franchise, he has a chance to do that stuff. But I just think, as we know in this market, um, they've never really yeah. had a true, true number one. And Quinn Hughes could be that guy. So I will say only because of the position he plays, I will pick. Love it. Number three, Netflix or Disney Plus? Netflix. We don't have Disney Plus. I, I mean, I've got a seven-year-old daughter. Yeah. Uh, so perhaps I should get it. But we have <laughs> Netflix, Crave, and Prime Video. Yeah. So, yeah. So I don't have Disney Plus yet, but wow. uh, I've been working my way through some of the Prime Video stuff. So <laughs> oh, that's uh, cool. But yeah, I, I would knew say if, if you were just giving me the choice of those two, I'm going to yeah. go Netflix. I knew you had the young daughter, so then I thought, well, young plus daughter, that's that's Disney Plus automatically. So Yeah, but she, now she's into more. She's watching like Full House and Fuller House. So <laughs> that's kind of what she's into now. So Awesome. Uh, Number four, who's the next Canucks player in the Ring of Honor? Oh, I get myself in trouble here because I, I've, always, I've often said that uh, it's tough to honor all those guys from 2011, right? Like how many guys can you have up there? I mean, uh, Alex Edler is going to be up there. Yes, I, mean, I he's, agree. He's, at this point, he's got to be. I mean, he's going to be the all-time leader in a number of categories as a defenseman. Yeah. I would yeah. love to see Kevin Biak. So I'll say Edler. I, I'd love to see Biak up there. Yeah. I'd love to see Bertuzzi up there. Yeah. Right? I mean, these are, these are, I think you have to pick the guys that really resonated with the fans. Sure. Um, so, but I'll say Edler, but I, I, I would like to see Biak and or Bertuzzi up there at some point as well. Cool. And I presume that's with the caveat of uh, Roberto's going up to the, the rafters as opposed to Ring of Honor? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess so tough too. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, maybe Ring of Honor now just because he's, he's, he's screwing us with the cap hit. So. <laughs> yeah, that cap recapture. Okay, last two questions. Number five, you can't offend me either way because I'm half of each. Do you prefer Japanese food or Chinese food? Oh, boy. Um, let's put it this way. <laughs> oh, let's put it this way. I love sushi. Okay, yeah. so I love, uh, I love Japanese food uh, for that. But if I'm cooking a dish, I would much rather cook a Chinese dish, a dish yeah, yeah. at home in a skillet or a, you know a slow cooker or something. So I'm better at cooking Chinese food, but I do sushi. Uh, just I love raw tuna, and yeah. uh, and I and that's kind of more my go-to. That makes perfect sense. Growing up in a, you know my late father was Japanese, emo. Uh, my mom's Chinese, so we ate Chinese food at home. That's what my mom cooked. So Japanese food for us was a treat. And that's why I, I did. So kind of the same thing, although I wasn't the one doing the cooking. Lastly, <laughs> speaking of food, you're not paying the bill. This other guy is. Who would you rather go out to dinner with because of food and conversation? Jim Benning, Travis Green, or Francesco Accolini? No, oh, I mean, I don't want to insult the higher ups, but I'm going Travis Green. You know, I think you're going to get more. I mean, I've, I've been out to dinner with uh, all of them, not one on one, but uh, at a table with them and, and Jim. And as we've seen with Jim with his interviews, he's very open with what he shares. And you have to be careful with what you're off the record, on the record, what's going on here. Uh, but Travis loves his red wine. Yeah. Um, you know, I, now maybe if Francesco wants to take me to Bora Bora for dinner or something like that and on a private jet, maybe I'm going that. But if you're just picking here, I'm going to go with uh, Travis a little bit uh, closer to my age and uh, and uh, could pick his brain on a number of things. No, absolutely. I agree. Uh, Jim Benning, uh, it'd be fun. He'd kind of be the, the old uncle telling tales and being very honest. Francesco, I, I think I'd be a little bit intimidated, quite frankly. And then Travis, yeah, just to talk X's and O's. And he seems very forthcoming and very honest, for sure. Yeah, and he'd give you a hard time over everything. So it's there always you, fun. There you go. Well, Dan, I appreciate you not giving me a hard time about anything. Uh, this half an hour went by very quickly, but I appreciate your time. And Best of luck and safe travels traveling to Edmonton and bringing your, your broadcasting flair to all of us back home. So good luck and safe travels and thanks for joining me today. Anytime, Clay. Thanks for having me on.